Hi guys, Pastor Preston is my name. I'm so excited to be here sharing the word of God with you. It was a great Sunday service, and of course, we've been having I've been having so many other um, leaders meeting, and of course, I shot some on videos before. But the Lord wants me to really talk to you on this one, uh, based on the question that someone asked. Someone asked a very brilliant question that I also think a very smart individual may be asking. Because from the service I shared um, in Luke's, where the Bible begins to talk to us about the need uh, not to invest um, in, in wealth and cause that wealth, you know, to be our comfort. And of course, Jesus in teaching them that said, the man who had invested in wealth and, and thought about that to be a comfort, um, it says, did not think about the fact that when death shows up, the angel of death shows up, all of all that labor will be in vain. And then Jesus now said, they should um, um, learn to seek him and not material things. Which of course you also find in Matthew chapter number 6, right? If you read from 18 down to 33, that whole expression. And of course, you also will see another first John when it says, Love not the world and, and, and neither the things that are in the world, but seek my ways. You also will see, of course, in First Timothy chapter number 6 when it begins to tell us um, that the love of money is the root of all evil. Right? Uh, another scripture also talks about the fact that um, it says, What shall it profit a man if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? So, you know, in line with all of what is expression in the New Testament that makes it feel uh, like God does not want us to pursue wealth. Now, the person is asking to say, So, if uh, that is the case, what about the scripture in Proverbs that say, A good man leaves an inheritance for his children? Right? He says, how will one have inheritance to leave for his children when he is not pursuing material things, uh, when he's not trying to heap material things? Amen. First, I want to say to you that that did not repeat itself in the New Testament. That uh, showed up only in the Old Testament in Proverbs. One of the things I want you to understand is this. Anything in the Old Testament that did not show up um, in the New Testament explained, then you may not have need to use them. You may just feel that he expired with the Old Testament, you know, uh, because I read a scripture today that showed that in the Old Testament, God just overlooked them. God was just trying to meet their need, even though that was not a perfect order. But God just responded to need. But in the New Testament, of course, God wanted their heart. Okay? That's the truth. He wants our heart and not uh, just that relationship based on need. He says that's not the perfect order of things. Glory to God. So if you don't find a direct scripture explaining it or scriptures that you could put together to, to apply what was shared from the Old Testament, then you can just leave it and understand that he doesn't have a relevance in the in the New Testament in Christ, according to the new order of Christ. Glory to God, somebody. So I just want us to look at scriptures and let me show you that in a proper explanation. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I'll also show you something that is close to that in the New Testament. Something that is close to that in the New Testament. So you can get that in a perfect um, explanation and not um, wrongly um, misleading yourself. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Proverbs chapter number 13, verse number 22. Proverbs chapter number 13, verse number uh, 22. This is what it says here. It says, A good man levered an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Right? Now I want to get a cross-reference on this. So I put the cross-reference, and then this is the first thing that pops up. Uh, um, Proverbs 28, 8. Proverbs 28 says, He that... He that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance, he shall gather it up for him that will pity the poor. You see that? So he says, He that uh, by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance, he shall gather it for the poor. The next cross reverence, Job chapter number 22, verse number 16 to 17. It says, Though he heap up silver as the dust and prepares raiment, as the clay, look at 17, he, he may prepare it, but the just shall put it on, and the innocent shall divide the silver. Glory to God. It says the just will put it on, and the innocent will divide the silver. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 2, verse 26, which of course seemed like a very close um, reference uh, of this expression. Look what it says here. For God giver to a man that for God give it to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. God give it to a man that is good, wisdom and knowledge and joy. Then it says, but to the sinner he give it travail, to gather and to heap up that he may give 
to him that is good before God, this, this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Now, this statement in Ecclesiastes is the same man who spoke the other one. Right? So, is the same person saying it. So, that means it, it could now begin to draw our understanding to feel that what is a good man leave it an uh, inheritance for his children's children? The inheritance may not be material possession like you think. Okay? The inheritance could be wisdom and knowledge and joy. Now, let us read of his father. What did David leave for Solomon, as it were, as expressed in scriptures? Glory to God. So we're going to read uh, Proverbs chapter number 4 from 5. Proverbs chapter number 4 from 5. Let's do from 3. I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Look at 4. He taught me also and said unto me, let thy heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and leave. Look at 5. He says, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from thy words of my mouth. So if David had emphasized material things to Solomon, right? I think when God had asked him and said, what do you want? Solomon would quickly say, oh, give me money, give me wealth. I want to be wealthy. You know, good man, listen, inheritance for his children's children. So I need to have enough so I can live inheritance for my children's children. Rather, he says, give me wisdom. With wisdom, he can have everything. So what is the inheritance a good man should leave for his children's children? Wisdom, knowledge, joy as used by Ecclesiastes 2. And of course, all of this can be summed up as a proper teaching of Christ, introducing them to Christ of the Spirit, knowing the love of God and functioning from Christ, learning to be obedient to God in every instruction. Of course, they'll be wealthy, they'll be fine, and they'll make it true. That's the best gift you can leave to anybody. Remember Jesus said, right, while the, that the lady was preparing food for him, but I said, yeah, it's nice, that. go join him, and let's get the food done. No, Jesus says, no. He says, this part she's chosen, that's Mary now. He says, she's chosen the best part that will never be taken away from him. Do you remember? First Peter chapter number one, he says, the word of God liveth and abideth forever. But all material stuff, he says, he tells us from that same scripture, he says, they will all fade like the, like the flower and they will all wither like the grass. Glory to God, somebody. So it's very important that you put your mind straight on God and do some things properly. Otherwise, you'll be driving people into a world of carnality that doesn't make sense. Think about it. In the New Testament, Testament. It's not about carnal pursuit of materialism. He had said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So the best inheritance a man can leave for his children is a godly way in a godly part in, in the will of God. Teaching the children to understand the will of the spirit, right? To do the things of the will of God. Opening their mind to sound doctrines, sound teachings, causing them to be wise of the spirit because they'll be able to generate even more for them. Do you know that some of the things that you're living for them at their own time might be old school, may not be relevant. Remember, Solomon was crying. He says, all this that I've just done, I'm not sure if my children can manage them properly. Then he calls them vanity and vexation of spirit. So if that's the nice thing to do, why was Solomon crying in Ecclesiastes 2? Why was he feeling bad? Because he knew that that's not the best thing to do to a child. So invest on your children. What's the best thing first? He says, turn up a child in the way he should go. And, and when he's grown, he, he will not depart from it. There is nowhere in the Bible where it talks primarily on the material thing that we need to leave for our, our, our children. Nowhere in the Bible. But in the New Testament, there's something that seems close to that. Yeah, I want to read that to you. That is in First uh, uh, Timothy chapter number 5 is number 8. First Timothy chapter number 5 is number 8. Glory to God somebody. Look at it. It says but if any provide not for his own and especially for those of his house, of his own house he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Right? This is close in the New Testament. Of course, when you read that in the context line, it was talking about widows that we must respond to and all that. And it was even saying that the widow should have brought up his children in a proper light so they'll be able to respond to him. So he was using this to say, uh, look at this, he says, uh, but if any does not provide for his own, and especially for, uh, uh, for, for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. What he's just trying to say, it is important that we care for people, care for our family, just like we care for the brethren. Glory to God, somebody. That's in no way talking about this because it's not talking about heaping uh, for your children, children. Hallelujah. Interesting. Glory to God. Glory to God. So we know it's a nice thing that we respond to people. We work hard. But this is the point. Look what the scripture tells you. It says, seek first kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added. All these things shall be added. So God's going to give you what you need and not just for you alone, but for your household. Glory to God, somebody. Because if you truly... Uh, if truly truly you're pursuing God rightly, he definitely will be responding to your need. Because the Bible says, Paul said, he says, a laborer is worthy of his pay. 
and that was financial pay. Yeah, and another scripture also says he was poor that we might be rich. But the point here is we don't pursue materialism. He gives it to us. We add word to ourselves that we earn it naturally. We don't pursue it. Hallelujah. We pursue Christ and his kingdom. Glory to God, somebody. And all, all these things shall be added unto you. Paul was a tent maker, but he wasn't pursuing word. As a matter of fact, he was using that for the work of the kingdom. Look at what the Bible says in Ephesians 4. He says, let him that stole steal no more, that he may have to give. Glory to God, somebody. That he may have to give, not have to build an empire. There's no way in the New Testament that begins to speak about the fact why we must be working so hard because we want to build an empire. Is it wrong to build a house? No, sir. Is it wrong to drive a good car? No, sir. Is is it wrong to have all these uh, blessings of life? No. Is it wrong to be wealthy? No. But it is not our purpose. It's not our focus. We don't run for it. So we are not living a selfish life. My Bible calls it the deceitfulness of wealth. Because all these things will, will, will fade up. But is it wrong to be wealthy? No, sir. It's not wrong. God wants to be wealthy. But he doesn't want you to be greedy. Go to God, somebody. So it's important that we understand this. And while I conclude, I want to also drive something very straight. But I want to pay attention to this. Right? Christianity is not sentiment. You don't use sentiment to run Christianity. You don't say, well, it's a good thing for me to do this. It's a nice thing to me. right? Otherwise, Jesus would have run Christianity when his parents showed up. And all that, Jesus would say, well, don't you know it's a nice thing for me to go and honor my parents? So we end the meeting and let me go do that. But rather, when he came to me and said, your parents are is around, they thought he didn't know. And what did he reply to them? He said, who is my father? Who is my siblings? He says, the ones who listen to what I'm doing. I'm, because he had to be on the father's business. Glory God, somebody. So it's not sentiment. Sometimes you think uh, you could be nice and be stupid. Yeah? You could be trying to to uh, do past work where God is leading you and be stranded. Yeah? Okay, because I've seen some people do some very silly stuff sometimes. They pack all their resources, they go give it to one greedy pastor, and when they're, they're, they're in lack and all, all that, the pastor even forgets that they are existing, and then people begin to mock them and say, I thought you were wealthy. What happened? The pastor is driving your car, now you are trekking. You're suffering like this. And then they say, we're suffering unto the Lord. Blah, blah, blah. That's not what it is to suffer unto the Lord. The sufferings of the Lord is to develop capacity, that painful capacity to help a believer grow, to keep telling them the same thing until they grow in the work of God. It's not about just doing some stupid things and suffering the consequences. I need you to get that into your score. Christianity is not sentiment. You don't run it by sentiment. You run it as an instruction of God. We take instruction from God and then we do it. We're not working for people to love us. We're not trying to be diplomatic and, and be loved by other people. Or we're not trying to be nice because we're oppressed. Or neither are we trying to respond to people uh, just for them to like us or enjoy us or say, that guy is very sacrificial. That guy is very nice. No, sir. You you have to respond to the instructions of God. As a matter of fact, you need to understand that. Christianity is the response of the human spirit to the voice of God in line with the will of God. Glory to God, somebody. So the Holy Spirit always leading us in the direction and the will of God. And we take such actions. Let me ask you a question. Simple thought. Right? When that man came to say, what will it take to gain an eternal life? Jesus who came to seek and save the lost. Why did he not just grab and say, this is an opportunity. He even came to me. But rather, he still followed the due process and the due protocol. And the guy walked away. Jesus didn't call him and say, oh, come back. Maybe I was too hard. You know, let me try to break it down, on, you know, do it like this or not. No, he allowed him to go. You need to understand that. It's very, very important. In as much as we want to save the old church, we are not going to get into some certain space that will cause us problem or even big problem in the faith. It's important that we understand this and not bring sentiment into the faith. Because once you bring sentiment, you will not achieve the purpose anymore. Think about this. Jesus was about to leave this earth. He had siblings. I can see if you say he doesn't have children, but he had siblings. He would have just said, well, Judah... I want to put you in charge of the church. And then uh, uh, James, uh, assist him. Or James, you are in charge. Uh, Judah, assist him. Rather, he gave it to the people who could do it properly. Even to his mother. He said, John, behold my mother. He had to go in the way of God. Right? And in all this that he was doing, he was trying to help you understand that when we become brothers in the Lord, it is thick like brothers in the Lord. So it's not something uh, we just say, bro, sis, and we really don't mean it. We mean it in our heart. These people really means a lot to us. So you can't carry people to have been running ministry for so long, and then suddenly you're thinking you should go out, and then you're thinking of your child, your, your wife, or your, or your children to take over from them. Maybe people who are not even sound in things of God. They are not elders. They can't even manage it, except Said the kingdom has become your company. Let's think about this. Because if it's not become your company, you will not be willing it to your children. Think about that, right? If you want to will something to your children, establish a company and will it to your children. But not the fate. 
It is too expensive for that. Jesus gave his blood for it. So every time you want to be sentimental and take it away from the truth of the word, always know that Jesus gave his precious blood for this. Anytime you can't say the exact truth, keep quiet. But don't bend it, don't twist it, because you could just mislead a lot of people in trying to be diplomatic. Think about this. So it's no sentiment. We have to stand for the truth and the truth only. Glory to God. Is it a good thing to leave inheritance for your children? Yes, it sounds very nice. But what if they are foolish? They sell it, use it to play pool or do betting. Yeah, you'll be shocked. As a matter of fact, there are some children who kill their parents because they want to inherit the property. There are some children upon the inheritance. They begin to fight each other and one will kill the other because of inheritance. How are we trying to say, no, don't do that? Why are you trying to, if I told you, you will be able to do that or you're going to do that. Make sure you bring them up in the fear of God, in the perfect truth of God's word. So they will not have a problem or be fighting or even plan to kill you before your time. Think about this because that's more important than that material stuff. A lot of family are in disarray today. There's so much sibling rivalry today because of property. And as a matter of fact, it even makes a lot of people lazy. Because, oh, my father has the empire. Why should I read books? Why should I work? And I went to Ibn University and I saw a lot of people in that regard. People who, who, whose parents are made medical doctors, uh, high top businessmen, and the children are not even serious. They don't know anything. They are not serious when because they're just dumping. Ah, after it, my father dies, I'll take over. I'm the first son. All is well. And then, of course, you know what they usually would do? They'll just sell up that company to take some drugs because they have not been rightly raised up. So I think raise up your children properly in the fear of God, right? The way they should go and not the way you want them to go or trying to uh, uh, beat them some kind of sentiment. And don't try to be greedy in trying to gather out the whole world where you'd have helped people and be kind to people because you're trying to gather it up for maybe one stupid son who is going to mess up everything. It is important that we do things according to scriptures and then be excited for standing with God always. This is my message. I believe this brings you a lot of blessing and I want you to use it right. Thank you. God bless you. I'll see you again. Amen.